Awesome. Thank you so much. How is everybody this morning? Are we good? It's so good to be in God's house, hey? Merry Christmas to you guys. Welcome to our new visitors. If you're new, uh, we're so happy that you're here with us this morning. I really hope that you enjoy the service. We're looking forward to some sausage sizzle, a snagger, um, and uh, face painting and the different fun we're going to have over at the grass area very shortly. But first, I want to uh, share the word of God with you. Is that okay? Yeah. The gospel, this is what it's all about Christmas, isn't it? The gospel, Jesus came to be born. And so over the past couple of weeks, we've been uh, sharing on our Christmas series, The Gift of Change. And when Jesus came, when Jesus was born on that night in Bethlehem, everything changed for humanity. What once was isn't anymore. It doesn't have to be anymore because everything changed when Jesus was born on that night in Bethlehem. And so we've looked at the gift of peace, the gift of peace, um, how Jesus came to bring us peace. You know, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He didn't come, though, to bring peace to this world. You don't have to look very far, really, to see that, right? It's pretty obvious. He, does, he, didn't, he didn't come to bring peace to this world, but he came to bring peace within. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I need that peace that comes from within. Yeah. Who else needs that peace that comes from within? God help us. Yes. As we face circumstances in our lives, and we all do, don't we? Yeah. As we face turmoil, as we face grief, as we face those challenging circumstances in our life, we need that peace that comes from within. And Jesus came to bring that peace. He came to bring that peace from within. He came to give that peace to you, despite the circumstances that you're going through. Some of us are going through stuff right now as you sit here and you smile and enjoy the carols and laugh at Pastor Jacob's jokes. <laughs> you're desperate for that peace within. The Bible says that it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. We don't understand it with our human minds. The Bible says that it's a peace that, that guards our mind and our hearts. And I don't know about you, but once again, I need that peace that guards my heart and my mind. I need it. I so desperately need it, particularly as we are journeying through this current pandemic. You know, we don't know what 2022 is going to bring. Our borders are opening. Some of us are bracing ourselves, some in fear, some not. But regardless, we need that peace from within. John 14, 27 says this, I leave the gift of peace with you, my peace, not the kind of fragile peace given by the world. The peace the world gives isn't the peace you want, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. He is the Prince of Peace and that peace you can experience through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I can give you and we will give you an opportunity after the service to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ where you can experience that peace within. And last week, Pastor Jacob shared on the gift of love and how remaining in God's love through God's command of loving others is the key to living a fulfilled life. It's the key to living a life of power and wonder, a life where God will do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you'd ever dare ask or dream, simply through laying down your life for another, just as Jesus did. He came and he laid down his life for us. And the Bible says, as we do that, as we do that there's power in that. As we remain in God's love, there's power in that. It's sacrificing what we want. And boy, the world can get pretty selfish. Thank you. And boy, the world can get pretty selfish. We can get selfish. But as we lay down our life for our friends, for our brother, for our sister, for our husband, for our wife, for our children, there's power in that. Jesus came to this earth as a baby and he died on a cross and rose again because of God's great love for us. How awesome is that? John 3.16 says, For here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. 
So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. How awesome is that? And so today within our gift of change series, today we're going to be speaking on the gift of hope. And it's a hope fulfilled. Uh, recently, I visited Adult and Teen Challenge. It's a drug and alcohol rehabilitation centre based in Esperance. And it's where I found hope 20 years ago. Before that, you see, I lived a life of drug addiction. And what comes with drug addiction or any type of bondage is this hopelessness. It's just hopelessness. And I found hope there 20 years ago. And the property is 30 kilometres out of Esperance and it's based uh, in a town called Gibson. And as you enter the property, there's a sign there. And this sign says, as you enter, it says, hope is found here, freedom lives here and changed lives leave here. And as I walked around the property, I was just reminiscing of how my life was radically changed over 20 years ago. And I was um, walking around and looking at the other people that were there currently in the program and how they too were being set free from drug addiction, depression, mental health issues, whatever it may be. And so I was in the chapel one day that's on the properties. There's beautiful chapel. There's a big cross that's surrounded by trees. Every tree represents a life changed. I planted my tree 20 years ago and I make sure I visit my tree every time I visit that property and I take a photo and you can see the tree growing and you can see, as I, you can see my kids growing when I've taken them down. I've got pictures with my tree. But I'm in the chapel and I'm, and I'm just praying and I'm dreaming and I'm, and I'm thinking about things. And I was just walking around the chapel and I came to the back wall. And on the back wall are these plaques. And each plaque represents a different name group. And on each plaque were just names of people. And these names of people are of people that have also completed the program. And also their lives have been radically changed. They too found hope somewhere in the many years of the ministry of Teen Challenge in WA. And as I was looking at these names, I saw names of people sitting here right here today. I saw names of people that are connected to families that are sitting here today. But as I continued to look at these names, I saw three names. And they were from different year groups. And these names were Jacob Hill, Isaac Hill and Sean Hill. Three brothers, one of whom I'm married to today. And as I read these names and the amount of years that they are spread apart, because they're on a different plaque each, so there's years between where they've completed the program. And, and as I was looking at it and just, I was completely blown away by this miracle that I could see before my very own eyes. You know, not many people come through heroin addiction. All three boys addicted to heroin, their lives messed up, living a life of sin. Not many come through that, but to have three sons, three brothers come through this life, come through heroin addiction to find freedom was absolutely mind blowing. And as I looked over these names and all, they all now married with families and contributing members to society, I think. Are you a contributing member? I think so. <laughs> Pastor Jacob, he does all right. Contributing member, I, I, I thought about their mum, my mother-in-law, and I just wondered how she must have felt for all those years, for all those years how she felt. How did she have hope and keep believing? Did she dare to imagine her three sons, not one, not two, but three sons to be set free? Did she lose hope along the way? When Jacob was in a coma for a week, when Isaac had a car accident and broke his neck, when Sean, just, he's the eldest, but <laughs> the longest to stay on drugs, 20 years, did she lose hope? Did her hope waver? What was she thinking? What was she feeling? What was going on? How did she keep hope and keep believing? You know, when I think about hope, I think, what is hope? And you know, we use the word hope so casually these days, don't we? I hope to be there. I hope to see you. I hope you're gonna come to our Christmas service. You better be there. I hope you're gonna be there Christmas Eve. But the biblical definition of hope is to have a, is to have a confident expectation 
to have a confident expectation. It's expecting to receive something and having a full confidence that you will. That's what hope actually means, to have a confident expectation. And you know, we all hope for something. We all do. We all hope our wayward son or daughter would come back home, would get back on track, would come back on the right path. We all hope for healing to take place in our loved one's life or maybe our own life. We're believing for healing. We hope we're going to get healed from this thing that's keeping us in bondage. How long is it going to go on for? I just want to be healed. We all hope to get that dream job that we've always been after. We hope to get married. We hope to have children. We hope to be a mother, a father, a husband or wife. We hope for these things. We hope for our children to come to know the Lord, that they too live the life and the belief and the faith that we have. We hope for that. We hope for our marriage to be reconciled. It's a mess. Maybe you're on the brink of divorce. Your wife's going crazy. Jake, be quiet now. <laughs> Shh. Maybe your husband's gone nuts and you hope to have the marriage you've always dreamed of. We hope. We hope for that relationship to be restored. You've been best friends for years. How could this situation split us apart? We've been believing, some of us, for these things for many, many years, many years, and we're tempted to say, is there really hope? Is there really hope? Do I dare to hope? Do I dare to hope? waiting for their, our loved ones to get their life, waiting for financial breakthrough. Some of us are just, it's week to week and we're desperate and we're hoping for financial breakthrough. Is there really hope for this healing to take place for my son or daughter? Is there hope for this addiction that I'm dealing with? And we ask ourselves, is there really hope? You know, back in the Bible times, a long time ago, you know, there were a bunch of people that also hoped for something and they waited many, many years for this hope to be fulfilled. They hoped a saviour would come, the redeemer, the rescuer, their Lord and saviour. And on one particular night in a town called Bethlehem, a mother went into labour, God bless her. She went into labour and she had her firstborn son and they named him Jesus. And when he was born, the Bible says that the very armies of heaven, the very armies of heaven, can you imagine? You think about an army, can you, the armies of heaven, the angels of heaven, that's what the armies of are the angels of heaven. And we're talking more than you can count, more than you can see. And they appeared when this child was born and they began to sing. And you guys were amazing, but could you imagine yeah. this vast army? Can you imagine them singing? Paul, that was amazing, but can you imagine them singing? And they sung this, glory to God in the highest realms of heaven, for there is peace and a good hope given to the sons of men and women. Let's just throw that in there. And some back then believed that this baby was the living hope that they had been waiting for. And some didn't, just like today. We have non-believers and we have believers. That's what we have. But as this baby grew, he faced every temptation that we face. He faced persecution. He faced ridicule. He faced uh, relationship issues. You know, I think one time it's like your mum and your, 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 your brother are, they're, they're, are out there and he's like, they're not my mother and brother relationship issues. He faced, he faced these trials and challenges just like we do in life, yet he was without sin. And he ministered the gospel to those around him. And this is what he said. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Think about that. He said, I, in 10, 9, I am the, no, in 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John 10, 9, he said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. He said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. 
And we're not talking about your belly and, you know, where you, you know, we're not, we're talking about spiritual, we're talking about in the spiritual That thing, you know, if you've always been searching for something, you know, I was searching for so many years, I didn't even know what I was searching for. And his name was Jesus. And then I got angry. I was like, why didn't anyone ever tell me that? For so many years I was searching. And his name was Jesus. Jesus says, you'll never go hungry again. You can stop searching. I'm the answer. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You won't thirst after other things. That desperate need within you is fulfilled, a hope fulfilled. He said in Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. You think, well, I'm not poor. None of us are poor really living in, in, in Australia, are we? But he's not talking, he's talking about poor in spirit. And we all, when we're born, are born poor in spirit because we're born separated from God. Every single one of us, when we're born, we are born separated from God because of Adam and Eve. Some blame Adam because he just stood there and some blame Eve. But I say Adam and Eve together, united. They can take the rap for each other. But we're all bound until we meet Jesus Christ, all of us, every single one of us. It's not until we meet Jesus that we can find that true peace, that true love, that true joy, that true hope. And a time came when Jesus was to be crucified so that we could be brought back into relationship with our Heavenly Father. That's how it is. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus came. And the reason why is because God created us to be in relationship with him he longs for his kids those that aren't in relationship with him he longs for them to come home to be with him to be back in relationship with him because when we're born we're separated from him and in order for that to happen for Jesus to be our savior our rescuer our redeemer he had to be crucified he had to be taking our sin upon himself he took his sin upon himself and then rising from the dead that had to happen so that he could conquer death and sin because we're all born sinners not one of us is righteous when we're born our family um our family (laughs) we've been uh our new netflix uh favorite series if you like is uh at the moment we're watching as a family somehow i've got sucked into this vortex Um, Jacob and the boys kicked off the trend and somehow myself and Tiffany have got sucked into it as well but it's young Sheldon we've been watching young Sheldon and uh, I know not overly spiritual I know I repent Um, but I want to show you a clip if that's all right let's go to the clip we can turn the lights off great for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son here we go Yes, Sheldon? When you said God gave his son to the world, did you mean Earth or the universe? Earth. But if God created the universe, wouldn't he want to save all of it? Yes, he would. Then why did you say Earth? Earth is a synonym for the universe. He's grabbing at straws now. So if God's plan is to save all of the universe, that means a race of octopus aliens light years away could only be saved by Jesus? Sure. Even though they never would have heard of him? Yes. Even though his appearance might be terrifying to them? What, why would his appearance be terrifying? He has four limbs and they have eight. Okay, that's enough. No, no. I prayed people would be more interested in my sermons. I suppose I should have been more specific. Sheldon, if these creatures were born without sin, they don't need to be saved by Jesus. What if an octopus Adam and Eve brought sin to their world? Would they be saved by a human Jesus or an octopus Jesus? Oh, and tell Sheldon I spoke to my seminary professor and the official ruling is God would appear to the octopus aliens in octopus alien form and save their eight-legged souls. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. I don't know why I'm watching this show, but anyway, it's pretty funny. Um, But just as it had to be an octopus Jesus, of course that's the answer. If they're octopus aliens, it has to be an octopus Jesus. 
to save these eight-legged creatures, just like Jesus had to come in a human form. He had to. He had to come as a human. Yes, he was 100% God and 100% man, but he came and experienced everything on this earth as a man. He was crucified as a man. He had to if he was to take on our sin and exchange it with his righteousness. He had to. And so Jesus was crucified and then he rose again, which left his tomb empty. And because his tomb was empty and no one had seen him, those that once believed began to doubt. Remember, we're talking about hope. Do we really hope? Is our hope wavering? Do I keep hoping? And we're talking about these people that believed that Jesus Christ was the saviour, the redeemer, the rescuer, they believed. But when they saw that the tomb was empty, they began to doubt. And so the women began to cry because that's what we do. We get all ugly and just cry. Well, some might cry pretty. I don't know. But anyway, Peter and some other disciples said, well, I'm going to go back fishing. So they got discouraged. Then they went back to what they were doing before. How many of us when we don't see things happening, go back to our old ways? How many of us go back to our old thinking patterns when we begin to lose hope, when we start feeling discouraged, when we become downcast? How many of us go back to our old ways when our hope begins to waver? And they went back fishing. Pete's like, come on, I'm going to go fishing. Not that there's anything wrong with fishing, but you get the point. Another two disciples decided to take a walk, a six-hour walk, mind you six hours but they walked away from Jerusalem away from other believers how many of us isolate when we begin to lose hope how many of us push other people away when we begin to lose hope how many of us wrap ourselves up in our negative mindsets and think it's never going to happen how many of us do that and the Bible says that these disciples were sad and gloomy. That's what it says in the, in, in the scripture. They were sad and gloomy. Who gets sad and gloomy? Where's the chocolate? Give me the salt and vinegar chips. I am sad and gloomy. They were downcast. They were depressed. They said this, we all hoped that he was the one that would redeem us, that would rescue us, that he was the rescuer of Israel. But no one has seen him. They began to lose hope that he really was the Messiah. They saw that the tomb was empty. And even though Jesus had prepared them for this day, he told them that's what's going to (laughs) happen. He said it was going to happen. But because they couldn't see it with their very own eyes, they began to doubt. They struggled to keep their hopes up. How many times when we see our tomb empty, we think the worst. We think it's never going to happen. We think all hope has gone now. But I want to say to you this morning, your tomb may be empty right now, but God has a plan. God has a plan. He always has a plan. And Jesus came to exchange our hopelessness for hope fulfilled. He is the hope fulfilled. He is the gift of hope and he gives us hope for all things. And no matter what you are going through, I don't care what it is. Don't disqualify yourself now because I know you're sitting there, some of you disqualify, but you don't know, Mel. You don't, I don't care what, it, I do care. I'm a, I've, I, don't get me wrong. I care what you go, but God can turn all things around for good. It does not matter what you are going through. He can turn all all things round for good. And we can have a confident expectation for good things to happen when we have Jesus in our life. Amen. We can stay positive and know that God will do something good regardless of the circumstances. Every day we can get up and say something good is going to happen today. Something good is going to happen today. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and accord according to his purpose for them. He works everything for good. No matter what you're going through, he can work it for good. He's always working behind the scenes. You might not see it. Your tomb may look empty, 
And sometimes it just seems to go on forever. It's like, does this black hole ever stop? But God has a plan. You know, even though the tomb was empty, when the, when, when the disciples saw that the tomb, God had a plan. You know, even, even, even though King Herod tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby, God had a plan. Even though Joseph wanted to divorce Mary, God had a plan. Even though the devil tricked Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God had a plan. Yeah. Wow. He kept having a plan. Yeah. He kept, God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for what you are going through. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Yeah. That's God speaking. Yeah. He knows the plans that he has for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And you know the good news is it's not just for you. Yeah. It's for your whole family. Yeah. God was never just about one person in your family. He's always been about whole households. Not just one person, but whole households. Jesus didn't come for one person in your household. He came for the whole household. So many times in scripture we read and we see and it's talked about where whole households get saved and set free and planted in God's house. You can believe that for your family. You can believe that for your brother and sister. You can believe that for your husband and wife, for your son or daughter. You can can believe that family is God's idea he loves family and he wants to see that in your life God is a God of restoration God is a God of reconciliation he's that that's who he is he loves family he can restore he can reconcile there might be a relationship in your life right now where you're hoping for it to be restored and reconciled God can do that he can do it. Nothing's too hard for God. Yeah. I mean, he spans the universe with the palm of his hand. Yeah. I mean, he had the young Sheldon talking about octopus aliens and all sorts of stuff. I don't know about all that. But the Bible says, I like what the Bible says, because what the Bible says, it's truth in that, right? And the Bible says that he spans the universe with the palm of his hand. And so eventually... Jesus began to appear to the disciples after they freaked out and had a meltdown, began to doubt, he started appearing to them and they started to believe again and word spread that the Messiah did really rise from the dead. Except for Thomas, one of his disciples, who knows Thomas? Thomas, doubting Thomas. He said in John 20, 24, he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were. He's very specific, isn't he? And some people are like that. Their intellect takes them away from their faith, from believing. They're too smart for their own good. Thomas said, and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Well, good for you, Thomas. You're going to miss out on a whole lot. I will not believe. And you know how gracious God was? Do you know how gracious he was? He actually came to his request. Verse 26, a week later, he, he, he left him hanging for a week. <laughs> You've been hanging. He leaves us hanging. You know why? Because he's building our faith. He could have appeared to Thomas right there, but he wants to build our faith. And so when you do it year after year after year, know that God's building your faith. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. How cool is that? Just walk through the wall. And he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side and stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Now I'm not Jesus in case you hadn't noticed, but I have the Holy Spirit within me. And the Bible says that it's to our advantage, it's better for us that Jesus go and he send us the Holy Spirit. So I have the Holy Spirit living within me, just as many of you do as well. If you're a believer this morning, if you're not, we can give you an opportunity very, very shortly. But I have the Holy, and so I'm saying today, standing here as Christ's ambassador, I'm saying to you, stop believing. Stop, don't stop believing. <laughs> Scratch, let me say that again. I stand here today as Christ's ambassador, and I say, stop doubting. 
and believe. I got it right. Believe again for those dreams. Believe again for that loved one to be healed. Believe again for your marriage. Believe again for your child. Believe again for your family to be reconciled and restored. Believe again for your husband. Believe again for your wife. Believe again for that dream job you've always been after. Believe again. Get your hopes up. You can believe again. He is the hope fulfilled. Believe again to be married. You want to get married? Believe again. Amen. Believe again to be a mother or a father. Believe again. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. Believe again. You know, Jacob's mum had to keep believing, not for one, but all three of her children over a span of 25 years. Do you know how strong her faith is? It's pretty rock solid. It's inspiring. 25 years. 25 years. She knew her God. She had Jesus within and she had a confident expectation. A confident expectation. She stood. I think one time Jacob actually died as a little baby and she said, no, he will live. And he started breathing again. She just knew. She has a confident expectation in her God of what he will do. And that's what we need. When our hope's wavering, when we're tempted to say, really, ever, is it going to? To have a confident expectation. And you can with Jesus. It doesn't matter if your tomb is empty. And you know, sometimes the story doesn't always go as you have hoped. That's just, it, I'm dealing with something in my life right now and it's not really what I'd hoped for. It's not. But do you know what I think? I think, well, God's got a plan. Amen. He sees the bigger picture. He knows what's happening yeah. and it's got to be better. Yeah. It's got to be better. Whatever's happening, he can turn around for his good because he's a good God and he wants to be good to you. He's a good God and he wants to be good to you. So sometimes the story does not end how we have hoped. And you may be living that right now. If you're living it right now, know that God won't leave you hanging. Amen. He won't leave you hanging. It's not the end of the story. It's just a chapter. Amen. What do you do when you read a book? You keep turning the pages. Amen. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. It's just a chapter. It's not the end of the story. God knows how to pivot. And he still has a plan. He pivoted. He had to pivot in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He always has a plan. And even if it's you that's messed it up, yeah. and sometimes we do, yeah. we make a mess of things through our own choices, yeah. through things we do. We make a mess. But God can turn a mess into a testimony. I mean, just look at Jacob <laughs> and Isaac <laughs> and Sean. And me, and many of us, really, all of us, none of us have got it right. But God can work that. Wow. He can pivot. He can move. He can, okay, that wasn't quite the plan, but come back over here and let's keep walking this way. As long as you come back over here and keep walking that way, if you stay over there, then there's not that much he can do. You can stay over there or you can come over here and let's keep walking. I'll pick up the pieces, I'll put you back together, I'll heal you, I'll help you, I'll strengthen you, I'll shape you, but I've still got a plan for you. I still have a plan for you. It's not the end of it. It's not the end of the plan. So our story is part of a greater story, right? The greater story of Jesus Christ. And God wants to use us to share his story. He wants to use us to share his hope and his love and his joy and his peace. And his story continues today through us over 2,000 years later. Yeah. How awesome is that? He wants to use and minister through every single one of you. Amen? We're called to take that hope that we have and give it to others. Yeah. We're called to take that peace, that unconditional love, that joy and give it to others. And this Christmas, I pray that you walk in that peace, hope, love and joy 
those gifts that Jesus came to give. When he came, when he was born, he came to give those gifts to you and he wants to exchange it. And so what he wants to take off you is he wants to take your anxiety. He wants to take your anger. He wants to take your unforgiveness. He wants to take your revenge. He wants to take your hatred. He wants to take your depression. He wants to take that bondage that you're experiencing, whatever it may be. Whatever it may be, he wants to take that. We've all got different bondages. He wants to take that and he wants to give you peace and love and joy and hope, a hope fulfilled. Amen? The team can come and begin to play if that's all right. You know, maybe you're in a place this morning where you've given up on all hope. And, you know, I did that many years ago, even to the point where I tried to take my own life. Lucky for me, God had a plan. God had a plan, lucky for me. God's got a plan for you too. I didn't see the point to life. I expected bad things to happen and I thought bad things will keep on happening. That's why I expected. I didn't see the point to life. I didn't understand while I was on this earth. I didn't understand why we were here. What's the purpose of us being here? Are we simply existing is this, this is what we're, is that all we're doing here? Just existing? There had to be a purpose to life. And the reason I didn't understand is because I wasn't in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, in a relationship with my Heavenly Father. And so I didn't get that. You know, when we have a confident expectation, which I did in bad things, you can have a confident expectation in bad things, or you can have a confident expectation in good things but both take faith you think you have no faith you've got faith if you're believing just for bad things bad things keep happening in your life this has always happened this is going to happen I can see that happening it's going to happen because you're utilizing your faith you're partnering your faith with that bad thing and it's going to happen or you can get up and say today is going to be a good day something good is going to happen today and put your confident expectation in good things both take faith. What will you choose? What will you choose? You know, when I met Jesus, I found hope, I found peace, I found joy, and I found unconditional love. And if you've never met Jesus, if we can just have everyone sitting right now, Jay, if you don't mind, just... If you've never met Jesus... If you've never met Jesus, today can be your day. Today you can enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you can find that peace and that hope and that joy and that love that he has for you. It's there on the table, but we need to make that choice. We need to say, yes, I want what you have for me. I accept what you have for me. And so just if our eyes are closed, heads bowed and eyes closed, if we can this morning. You know, Romans 10.9 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so it's just a simple prayer to take that step towards him. It's accepting him into your heart and saying, I believe. I believe that Jesus came. I believe that he was risen from the dead and that he is my Lord. And today I choose to make him my Lord. And so if that's you this morning, I just ask that you raise your hand in the air. If you just slip it up into the air and pop it back down. And we're going to all pray together as a church. If that's anybody here this morning. I'm just going to wait a few moments. If anyone wants to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today. We're going to pray all together if you're online. If that's you, let's pray. Church, if you can pray after me. If you're praying this for the very first time, just mean it with all your heart. And God will meet you where you're at. 
Your heart might be beating fast. You might be a little fearful, but God will still hear this prayer. If you follow after me, church. God, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for me. I ask that you forgive my sins. Wash me clean. And today I choose to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to pray over the rest of us as well, including those that maybe gave their heart to Jesus just then. Lord, I just thank you for every single person in this house right now. I thank you for everybody online as well, Lord God. Father, I pray that you'd touch your people, Lord. We thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord God. We thank you for your love, your joy, your hope, a hope fulfilled, that you are the hope of the world. And I pray for each person as they go about their Christmas, Lord, that you'd be with them, that you'd go before them, that you're behind them, that you're around them, that you're in them, that your peace would flood them, that they would know that they have a hope in you. Whatever situation they are dealing with, whatever uh, circumstance they are facing, that they would know that there's always hope in you, that you turn all things around for good, that you make everything work together, that you have a plan. Even when we go on a little detour ourselves, you bring us back and you still have a plan. So we thank you for bringing us back We thank you for making us a part of the greater plan, the greater story of Jesus Christ. And I pray you touch the hearts of your people, Lord God. We commit their Christmases to you, Father. We pray you will be done, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Fantastic. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing a carol before we head off and have some fun, a sausage sizzle. Take it away, Paula and team. Just sing. 